If you have a Bible, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. Just to kind of fill us in a little bit, last, last week David received news that, that the king, that Saul was dead. And he, he mourns and he laments over the loss of the king and over the loss of his, specifically his beloved friend Jonathan. He also mourns over the state of Israel because there was a, a massive defeat by the hands of the Philistines. So it wasn't just a, a king and some, some of his sons who were, who, who were killed, but, but many others had sons or husbands or brothers die as well. And he also mourns not just the passing of those men and of the army, but he mourns of the state that Israel finds itself in. And so today, in chapter 2, we pick up the account, starting in verse 1. And after this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, and David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When they told David it was the men of Jabesh Galid who buried Saul, David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Galid and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord. Because you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you, because you have done this thing. Now therefore, let your hands be strong and be valiant. For Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ish. Bosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahananim, and he made him king over Gilad, and the Asherites, and Jezreel, and Ephraim, and Benjamin, and all of Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So David hears the news, Saul is dead. David knows he's the anointed one of God. He's to be the next king. Yet he receives this news in exile at the ruined site of Ziklag, cut off from his people. But now in these first few verses here, we see something that is very different from the previous king. We see one who goes directly to the Lord, and through the wisdom of God, we see one who is ascending, being raised up by the Lord and exalted at Hebron. Why does God send David to Hebron? True, it is, it is the largest city in the Judean territory. It also actually sits on a pretty good plateau, so it's a well-defendable uh, site from enemies. But God sends David, not just for those reasons, but because the city's special. There's a deep connection with the patriarchs, the, the fathers of the nation of Israel and this city. Maybe you're familiar with Abraham. If you were a kid, you learned the song, Father Abraham and many sons. Well, he didn't have that many sons. Let's talk about the generations after generations after generations. But, but Abraham, who was a nomadic man traveling from place to place to place, owned only one piece of land in all of the promised land. It's a cave right outside Hebron. A cave where he and Sarah would be buried. Where Isaac and Rebekah would be buried. Where Jacob and Leah would be buried. The fathers of the nation are buried in Hebron. 
Abraham was promised that the land would be his. And in many ways, Hebron is the first part of that inheritance. And so now you have God's anointed king kind of starting his expansion of his kingdom. Where? Hebron. It's also interesting, if you're a little bit more familiar, I know that, that sometimes you maybe forget some stories and things like that, but, but Hebron was also a city of giants at one time. And when the nation of Israel was coming in, it's Caleb who was sent out to, to spy some of these areas, and he spies out Hebron, comes back, says there's giants, and, and Joshua and Caleb and others defeat the giants, and Caleb is given that city for his family to live in. And now we have David, another giant killer, living in the city of Hebron. You also read in the book of Joshua, in chapter 21, this city, Hebron, is set aside as a city of refuge, a city of safety. So in one mere word, Hebron, the people, the original readers, and I hope a little bit through my quick review here, my cliff note version, you, you, you start to see God is saying a lot without saying anything at all. Go up to Hebron. That's all he says, but, but he is saying a lot. He's saying, go to where the kingdom will begin and where it has already began. Go to where, where giants have been slayed before. Go to where the forefathers of our nation Lie and rest. But as this is occurring, over the Jordan River, in many ways, often what's considered outside of the promised land, there's another king being set up by Abner. Abner is a, a relative of Saul. Sometimes he's called a cousin. Sometimes he's called an uncle. Uh, he, he's a relative of Saul, but, but he's, he's the commander of Saul's army, which... Just so you know, that, that's code for the rest of Israel. And he is scheming to set up Saul's lone surviving son as king. Abner is functioning just like the other nations around Israel function, yet here in the nation, God is setting up his king. Beloved, when you look at this chapter, it smacks us in the face that there are two kingdoms being established. Two kingdoms are being established and they are meant to contrast one another. We have one kingdom, David's kingdom, which is being established under the divine authority and the divine guidance of God. And, and we know and the people of Israel know that David is the anointed one. He's supposed to be king. But in verse 1, when David is done mourning and lamenting over the loss of the king and the people and his, his friend Jonathan, he goes to God and says, shall I go up into the cities of Judah? He doesn't just say, okay, I'm done mourning. Guys, get your gear. We're going in. He goes to the Lord. He seeks God's word and direction. Again, we have a contrast here. David seeks after the word of the Lord, and the Lord comes and answers him. And David asks again, okay, where specifically should I go? And the Lord answers him. Contrast that with Saul when he was seeking after the Lord, and the Lord wouldn't answer him at all. Contrast that with Abner. There's no prayer. There's no, there's no nothing from Abner. It's just, let me go find Saul's son. Let's put the crown on him. Let's keep things how they're going. It's amazing because Saul himself concedes to David, you will be king. God is with you. If you were with us weeks ago in 1 Samuel chapter 26, David and one of his men crept into the camp and had the ability to kill King Saul, but instead just steals his spear and takes his canteen and then sneaks out of the camp and he actually calls out to Abner, Abner, you are asleep on the job. The king could have been slaughtered. And Saul says, is that your voice, David? Standing right next to Abner, he says, you will be king, David. Surely God is on your side. 
So Abner knows that David's to be king. Abner also standing next to even Saul knows that David would be king. Yahweh was David. Yahweh was with David. And Yahweh was directing David. And yet Abner still tries to set up another kingdom. In verses 8 to 10, we, we see this, this kingdom. One kingdom is established by divine right, and another kingdom is being inaugurated, rather, not by God, but human ambition. Abner, the son of Ner, establishes this kingdom. And you might be wondering, why? Why, why would he do this? Why is he doing something that, that's going to cause division amongst the nation? Surely it is because Abner understood his authority, his power. He was kind of like second in charge, would be stripped away by the new king and the new kingdom. Generally, when you are king, the generals who were in charge of the armies that were seeking you for a good 15 to 20 years, you don't say, how about you keep the job? You did so good at almost killing me numerous times. You can stay in your post. Abner is a seasoned warrior. He, he sees that his power would probably be taken away. And, and we're not going to have time to, to go into First Chronicles, but you'll find out that, that Abner is basically the power behind Saul's son here. You could probably note at some of this because we read in the text he was 40 when he's crowned king, and you might wonder, why were you not fighting with the rest of your family? Ish-bosheth is crowned king by Abner over Israel, or at least most of Israel. And names are important in Scripture, and, and ish Bosheth's name means man of shame. So it's interesting, you have David, whose name means beloved, and then being crowned on the other side of the, the country, you have the man of shame. Ishbosheth also has another name. Twice he's called by a different name in the book of Chronicles. He's called Eshbal, which means man of Baal. Baal was a name used for another god. So we have two kingdoms being established, one by God, the other by man. One, by, one has the Lord's anointed sitting on the throne, the other has the shameful man or a man of other gods sitting on a throne. There's something amazing happening here, which I never thought of any other time when I've read through this chapter or read through this book of, of Samuel until I was sitting in my study preparing for the sermon with David being anointed at Hebron. The kingdom of God flickers into sight for the first time in physicality with his king on the throne. David is the first anointed king of God sitting on a throne. It's a small flame, and, and, and I think others see it, I, I, you know, but, but there are others who desire to snuff it out before it grows into a blazing fire. But before a moment, right here, this flickering flame, we see God's king ruling on the earth for the very first time. But it's a mustard seed kingdom. It's, it's tiny. It's, it's almost insignificant. It's basically only ruling over a portion, one tribe out of the 12. But as we know, the mustard seed eventually grows into a great tree that provides shelter and shade for any who find it. Beloved, even today there's two kingdoms. We could ask the same question of people today that we might ask of the ancient folks that we are reading in this, in this passage. Why aren't people eager to receive the kingdom of God? Why wasn't Abner eager to, to receive David as king? Why does he try to set up another kingdom? Have you ever asked that question? 
Maybe not in that exact phrasing, but, but I've had conversations with, with brothers and sisters in the Lord who have come up to me and they, they're almost dumbfounded when they try to share the gospel with someone. They're like, I don't know why they wouldn't want this. I don't know why they wouldn't want to be part of, of this glorious kingdom, why they wouldn't want the, the eternal life that you can have when you're with Jesus, the, all of these things, the good news of the gospel. Why do they reject it? Why don't they want it? I, I don't get it. To which I lovingly say, of course they don't want the new kingdom. Because it's not good news to them. I mean, the kingdom of God is always good news, but, but when you hear it and, and you don't want it, it doesn't sound like good news. And they would say, well, why wouldn't they want it? Say, because then they're not king. Jesus is king. And in my kingdom, I'm king. And I don't want the good news of this new king and the good news of this new kingdom because then that means there's rules and rules that I would have to fall under and, and there's decisions that, that he makes that I no longer get to make and, and that there's, there's, there's now one that I have to be held accountable to and, and maybe I don't like the things he's holding me accountable to. Every moment when you choose to sin, you are saying one of those things. And what you're saying is, I want the other king, which usually is yourself. Sisters and brothers, there, there is two kingdoms being established, and we need to ask ourselves, whose reign do we desire to come under? We all are making a decision to follow one kingdom. We all are making a decision to, 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 to bend our knee to one king. And the question is, which one will it be? And may, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not going to make any decision because I'll just, I'll just play the fence. You know, I'll ride that fence as long as I can. And I just ask any of you, have you ever gotten stuck on a fence before? It's not very comfortable for very long. And actually, the reality is, there is no fence. Because if you're making no decision, you've already made a decision. And it's not to bow your knee to God's anointed king. It's to bow your knee to another king or another kingdom. But there's good news, and here's the good news. This morning, all of us, in a way, live in Jabesh Galid. All of us are found in this, this city, Jabesh Galid. We're all at a crossroads. We all have a decision whether we're going to align ourselves with the anointed king of God and, 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 and what he is about in that kingdom and, and seek to expand his kingdom, or are we going to come under another king and, and seek to live for that kingdom? The people of Jabesh Galid, if you'll remember, they, they, they were saved by Saul. They were going to be slaughtered by the Amorites and, and the newly crowned King Saul comes to the rescue and saves them. And so they honor Saul and they, 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 they put their own lives in danger by, by going out and, and cutting down Saul and his sons whose bodies, their carcasses are, are hung out for food for the birds on the, out, on the wall of the city. They take it down, they bring it back, they bury them, give them a proper burial. They honor him. David comes and asks, who are you going to align yourself with, the rightful king or Saul's son? And they have a decision to make. This is what I'm saying. Every day of your life, you are like the people of Jabesh Galid. You have two choices, this king or this king. Every day, which one are you going to follow? Notice how David approaches the people. When David finds out what they have done, notice how he approaches them. He comes with wisdom, but he comes gently, but yet he is conveying a weighty truth in this passage. He points out to them, this is where, I love it, he's wise. He's like, you were faithful to the king. Now don't forget, he points out, hey, I've just been crowned king. 
Right? You've been faithful to the king. You, you, you did a mighty thing. He blesses them. May, may, may the faithful love of God be upon you. He also encourages them. He says, may your hands be strong. May you do these, the, 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 you know, be, be valid, be, be, be good, be, be doing these things. Then note what he says here. The house of Judah has anointed me king over them. That's kind of like a nice way of saying, like, great job, I'm king. I pray that God would bless you, I'm king. If you join me, I'm king, I would be good to you, I'm king. If you have a Bible, keep your finger in there because we'll come back to it, but, but flip over to, to Matthew chapter 11. There's a little bit of, of an echo, if you will, in this passage in, in 2 Samuel to, to something that, that Jesus says in, in Matthew 11. In Matthew 11, verse 28, and 28 to 30, maybe you're familiar with this, this passage, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isn't that a beautiful passage? You come to me, you, you, you are weary, heavy laden, I will give you rest. But notice he keeps using the word yoke, yoke, yoke. What do you use a yoke for? You, 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 you put it on the animal so that the animal does work. And whose yoke is it? Jesus's. So even it's, come to me, I come, I come lowly, I come with a soft heart. I got a yoke for you. It's my yoke. I'm putting it on you. I'm controlling you. I'm leading you. I, I'm directing you. It's, I, I'm here to take your burdens. I give you one. There, there's a little one. It, it's, it's light compared to the rest of the world, but it's there. There is a yoke. There, there is direction. There's guidance. There's leading. There, obviously, you are the servant. I am the master. But as you can see, there, there, it is this sweet passage because it's not a master who comes to beat the animal. Like Dave is trying to say, he's not, he's not a king to come and like strike down his, his citizens. He comes lowly. He comes gently. Yes, I'm king, but I'm a good king. Jesus, I'm the master, but I'm, I'm a good master, a kind master. How will the people respond? This is where I wish the Bible shared the answer. I wish we would turn the page and the people would say, they prayed about it and they said, yes, we will follow you, David. But the Bible doesn't give us an answer. We don't know how they turn out. You can imagine the conversation that the people were maybe having on that day. The messengers come and, and okay, David is now king. We know David is the anointed one of God. But Saul's son, we love Saul. Remember what Saul did for us. His son's being crowned over there. Which one should we do? Yes, David will be good to us. But what about others? Will others be good to us? Large swaths of Israel's tribes have already aligned themselves with Saul's son. Should we? Beloved, we all, in a way, live in Jabesh Galid. The son of David, Jesus Christ, has sent messengers, heralding his reign, heralding the good news of his kingdom. He comes to us patiently. He comes lovingly. He comes with care and, and mercy and, and kindness. And, and we look at the kingdom of God right now, at the world we live in, and we say, where is it? It's, it's a mustard seed right now. We don't really see this glorious, powerful, reigning king. We look around and we see the rival kingdom and says, well, that looks powerful. That looks strong. None of those seem to be connected with Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves, this day and every day as we move forward, which king are we going to serve? Because we need to contemplate things. Yes, following Jesus, he will be good to us, but my spouse might not if I follow him. Jabesh Galid the people of that city are Benjamites. Saul was a Benjamite.
you don't have this so much here. I mean, I know you have it a little bit because you've got the cardinals and you've got the royals. But they're on other sides of the state. Where I grew up, you have the Yankees and then some other team. My best friend is a diehard Mets fan. But one cousin, right, their whole family, Mets, Mets, Mets. When my first son was born, we got Mets gear from them. I'm like, we're not Mets fans. He's like, you are now. But my best friend, he has one cousin who's a Yankees fan. Guess who doesn't get to sit at the adults' table at Thanksgiving? <laughs> He's like, why? They're a better team. Why, 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 why? They're like, no. Can you imagine that? When it comes to a king, this one city, we're with David. Don't come for Christmas. We got nothing for you. You can go to David's house for Christmas. This is what they're having here. And beloved, I pray that we would see that this is something that we have to deal with regularly because maybe some of you are going to experience some tension in a couple days sitting at the Thanksgiving table because you're the only Christian in your family. You have chosen that king where everybody else at the table has chosen a different king. Until Jesus comes with his full array of glory, might, and power, this tension between these two battling kingdoms will continue forever. You will see it in your home when a child decides, I want nothing to do with the church. You'll see it at work when, when you have a, a coworker who is seeking to be manipulative or, or deceitful and, 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 and you know it's not right, but, but you're not sure what to do. As long as there is breath in the lungs of the human race, there will be rebellion against this king and his kingdom. Sometimes it's open, blatant rebellion, and sometimes it's hidden rebellion. So brothers, sisters, search your heart. Ask yourselves, who will be king here? And I plead with you, see the good news that you live in Jabesh Galid today. You have the choice today. It's not too late. Maybe you have... Maybe you were there at the crowning of this other king. Maybe you were found in the ranks of the kingdom and you have even mocked the anointed one of God and you have even mocked the other citizens of that kingdom, God's kingdom. It's still not too late for you because today you find yourself in the city. Today you hear from me, I pray, the good news. The king has come and he is good. Choose today. Even after 50 years of being in the camp of the other kingdom, choose today to come follow the true king. It's not too late. Beloved, Yahweh's King Jesus comes in grace and peace now. King Jesus has sent messengers. He, he's the good king. He sends good news. I'm king. I, I'm here to reign. I will treat you right. I will take care of you. I will protect you. I will do good to you. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 4. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. First words, Jesus speaks in Luke's gospel. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and to recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What he's basically saying is the kingdom of God is here. Here I am. It's by Christ's perfect life, by his death on the cross, by his resurrection, it is by that that any are saved and brought into the kingdom of God. It's by grace. He graciously comes to this city and says, 
I will take care of you. They didn't do anything for him. He comes in grace and peace, and I put now. Because as you will find out in the next chapter, eventually David has to pick up a sword and go to war. And I plead with you, church, take a moment and contemplate. What kingdom do you want to live for? Christ comes in in peace and kindness and grace and mercy and love and he says, all of it's for yours. All you need to do is, is believe in me and it's yours now. And we cling to things that are fleeting and momentary. We put our hope in something that is gone in a minute when we have eternity on the other side. I want to encourage you, it is not too late, but there will be a day when it is too late. Which kingdom will you live for? Because the king of this world, this kingdom, does not give, it only takes. It does not bless, it only curses. Sometimes I think we have a wrong view of heaven and if we would only just think of heaven rightly. And for some of you, me even saying the word heaven makes you think of things that are not right. Heaven isn't clouds and babies in diapers floating around with wings on. Heaven is actually a new earth when everything will be wiped away that has ever caused you harm or pain or sorrow. Heaven is is a delight and a joy. Heaven is undescribable because nothing on this earth can even come close to matching what it is. Heaven is amazing because Christ is there and he reigns in his fullness. And every moment of every day when you said, that's not fair, I wish it would be this way, if only this could, that's how heaven would be. Is that a kingdom worth living for? Or do you want to live for this one that you will just be blown away? Yahweh's king, King Jesus comes in grace and peace Now, the kingdom of God has expanded through a message of hope in Christ, not by the sword. Genuine expansion of Christ's kingdom was never found at the edge of the sword. Maybe you're familiar with Charles the Great. Sometimes goes by the name Charlemagne. He was the first holy Roman emperor. He was not very holy. He wasn't Roman, and he really wasn't an emperor. How he got that name, I'm not sure. But he was known for slaughtering thousands of the Saxons and and other people groups. Why? Because he basically said, be baptized into the Roman Catholic Church or die. What he thought he was doing was he thought he was expanding Christendom. Can you imagine that? Be baptized or die. Where's the water? Let's go. Do you think there were really Christians? Isn't it amazing that God, who has sovereign power over all things, didn't come to force you, but instead comes graciously and says, here's the message. You could not do what needed to be done, so I sent my son to do it perfectly. Your sins are washed away if you would just believe in him and him alone. I sometimes think, I know I'm reading a little bit in between the lines here, so, so bear with me. This isn't, this isn't word of God. 
But as David sends these messengers to Jabesh Galid, you assume that other cities or other people had to hear. Maybe it was someone else in another town who said, I, I, I want to come in peacefully. I want to come in, in, in that way. I, I, I don't want David to, to mount his army and, and, and to ride in and destroy us. News had to get out. Christian, how do you think the news of the kingdom gets out? David sends messengers who were already part of his kingdom to the city of Jabesh Galid. David sent messengers who were already part of his kingdom. This king, Jesus, the anointed one of God who comes in mercy and peace now, sends out messengers who are part of his kingdom now. Let us be heralds of the good news because when the king comes in his fullness, look out. Once you boil down all things and you look past all the supposed options that are out there, you will find that there really are only two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of man or the false kingdom. And I pray that you would seek the kingdom of God. Those who were found there those who are living under the anointed one of God will experience the true blessing of God. They will experience his steadfast love. They will experience his peace, his rest, his joy, his life, the abundance of the kingdom that is there. It is there. It is there. It is there. It is there. I'm saying it again because you look around with these eyes and you say, where, where, where? I don't see it. And he said, I'm going to my father to prepare a room for you. If it was not so, I would not say it to you. It's there. I can't see it, but I know it's, it's there. And it's more there than this is there. So choose this day. Think carefully. Who will you live for? What king will you serve? Who will you bow a knee to? Because one day, the heaven and the earth will be rolled up like a scroll. And a new one will be established. And the fullness of the reign of King Jesus will be shown over all the land. And it will be everywhere. There will be no shadow where anything could be hidden from it. That's a kingdom that we want to live for. Not the one that's here one moment and gone another. And beloved, there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the words of an old Christian friend of mine, it's best to practice now than on that day. So I would encourage you, there is a great kingdom with a glorious, gracious king, and it can be yours now. It's not too late. It doesn't matter how bad, how broken, how evil, even if your name is Abner, it is not too late. I'm going to spoil something here a little bit. Abner eventually realizes that David will be king. And Abner comes to David, and David forgives him. David doesn't kill him. David doesn't mock him. He forgives him, and he gives him peace and lets him go. So even if you're an Abner, or even if you're a Saul, or even if you have a really, really bad name like Ishbosheth, it's not too late. You can enter into the kingdom of God today, and it will be yours forever. Which king will you live for? I pray that you experience the joy of King Jesus over all the false kings. Let's pray.